Okay, we're back. We're live. Two o'clock rock here on a given Friday with uh, Ethan Allen. We're, we're both hosting together, okay? <laughs> and uh, I guess the title of this episode is Inlikable Science. You know, some people don't like science. <laughs> There they are people just who don't. don't like science, yeah. and we have to explore that today. Yeah. And you found an article, didn't you, Ethan, um, indicating uh, one, we're talking about one scientist who uh, is standing firm uh, when when his department, the Department of the Interior, United States Department of the Interior, um, diminished his scientific role in that department. Yes, this this guy was a uh, uh, he was formerly the uh, Office of Policy Analysis at the Interior Department and was in charge of uh, a lot of the issues with Alaskan uh, natives and their land use and the issues of climate change on this and was raising the very valid point that these people are in danger, basically. These villages, these communities, this whole way of life is in danger. These places exist low on flat land. The sea levels are rising fast. Uh, they are in danger of any storm surge coming over, flooding their villages. There are no evacuation plans. Um, there are no funding to move them anywhere else. All these things that apparently the new head of the Department of uh, Interior doesn't uh, Pinkley. Yeah, doesn't want uh, shared. And so they moved this guy in and, and have him in accounts receivable now for some group getting used processes, checks from fossil fuel companies. Which is very ironic right. and sort of dark humor. Indeed. As an environmentalist is right. processing your checks from fo right. fossil fuel companies. Right. And he points out there's a whole, his boss basically has stated to Congress that they're using this method of transferring employees to, to very sort of inappropriate positions as a way sort of to call the department and get rid of people who they don't like and get push people out so they'll quit in frustration. Yeah. Um, well, it's like, it's like the uh, Japanese notion of the room, the room with a window. Mm -hmm. If you are, uh, if you have fallen from grace within the corporate structure of a Japanese company, you get a room with a window. You get nothing to do. Just look out the window. And, you know, you, you're retired in right. place. You're, right. you're, you're relegated to the margins. Yeah. And um, that's what it sounds like happened to this guy. Right. And it's, it's a huge waste of taxpayer money because you're taking people who are talented, have expertise, have talents, capabilities in one area. You're ripping them out of that position, sticking them in some other area where they don't have any expertise or talents paying them to do that. You've paid for moving expenses and transferring. You're leaving the position they were in, performing a valuable service empty, so no one's giving the services they were providing. Yeah, it, it's, it's a lose, lose, lose. Yeah, well, for the country, for sure. Right. Um, but, you know, but uh, there's a lot of lessons to be drawn from this article. What was his name again in the article? Uh, Where did the article appear? Th this was in the Washington Post. Uh, the, his, Joel Clement was the, he was the director yeah. of the Office of Policy Analysis in yeah. the Interior yeah. Department. So where we thought that, uh, you know, Trump's attempt to, uh, you know, diminish the government's, um, you know, efforts in preserving the environment was limited to the EPA. That's right. not true. Right. No. It's across the board here yeah. in the Department of Interior. Right. The same kind of thing that is happening in, in the EPA. Same right. thing. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's, that's, uh, I guess in, in Interior, they're saying something like 4,000 positions are basically liable to be impacted within the near future. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And the other thing that strikes me just on, on the surface of it is that uh, this is really important that that while we are knocking around with health bill issues that cover the front page and all the, the Russia investigation that covers the front page, the first 20 articles mm -hmm. in the New York Times every day is about Trump. He has great ratings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> he's doing this. It's quiet. Right. It's not in Congress. It's, uh, you know, exercising arguably his power as president uh, to, you know, make or unmake regulations. Right. Uh, and, uh, and, and to uh, do this kind of, have his people, his cabinet appointments, do this kind of musical chairs kind of thing, effectively pulling the wings out of the environmental effort in the whole government. Right, right. To totally dismantling structures, processes that were set in place uh, to... to carry out the needed functions. I mean, we, we created the EPA to protect our environment so that we could live longer, healthier lives and be, be uh, inflated against some uh, environmental insults. And yeah. basically, Scott Pruitt got up there in front of Congress last week or two weeks ago and basically tried to defend 
an e his request for the EPA, which was lower than, than any request, I think, since the 1980s for the, an EPA budget. You're voluntarily killing, the, and, the agency killing itself, right. thanks to and, him. And he, and he tried to make the argument that this lower budget was going to enable them to focus more cleanly on their uh, true central mission and carry it out more effectively. So, Jay, if, if, if I take away, you know, two of your cameras here and half your lights, uh, is Think Tech going to be able to, like, focus more clearly on, on doing what it is they do? Well, it's, it's more than a crock. It's a lie. Yeah. It's a lie. Oh. And, and, and it's persuasive, pervasive, rather, uh, through this administration. The people lie. Lying is becoming the new normal for the officials around Trump that has, Trump uh, appoints. Right. And that, this is a real problem when it comes to science because... Well, science does not claim in any sense to hold a monopoly on the truth or, or even be the truth. Science is a relentless pursuit of the truth, right? We are always, as scientists, trying to get closer and closer and closer to the truth. And in this sort of wholesale systemic dismantling of a lot of government agencies that support science, the, the, the whole issue of truth becomes very vague. Who can you believe? It's all fake news now, right? Uh, you know, Trump is always claiming that, you know, there's fake news everywhere except in his own brain, basically. And it's, it's really terrible. It, it's destroying the public trust in science. And in government. And, and the government, right, at the same time, right. And it, it's, it's appalling. Uh, we, we can't operate if we don't have, if we don't trust our government, right? I mean, oh. um, unless you're going to have a, a dictatorship or... You know, the only person well, who's trusted we'll, as a dictator, right? We'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, well, yeah, that's... Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, so what you have here is, uh, it's not just environment, it's science. Right. That's, that's another sort of uh, inference you can draw from this article and this event. Right. Uh, that it's not just uh, the Department of uh, the EPA, the Department of Interior, it's through right. the government. Um, and it's not just about environment, it's about science. I mean, he's defunding right. medical research, uh, yeah. he's defunding you know, all kinds of scientific research all around the country. Sure. Uh, the, the education department is, is being cut and its efforts to ensure uh, equity and equality among diverse groups are being just slashed. They're being told not, not to pursue these kind of cases they, when they've been going after school districts that are handing out funds disproportionately. It, it's truly, uh, yeah. And, and, and footnote to that is, is, is he's, he's reducing or attempting, and I hope he never gets a chance, but he'll be working at it, attempting to reduce taxes on the wealthiest people in the country and uh, relatively uh, uh, increase them, proportionately increase them on the less advantaged people in the country, shifting the wealth exactly. uh, from the poor to the rich. It's a sort of Robin Hood in reverse. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, and, and so you see all these, quote, savings that he's engaged in, but they're oh. savings um, wh where, you know, it's going to inure to the benefit of the rich. That's right. the benefit of the savings. Right. I mean, the health care bills that have come out have, have all been basically exactly that way, it is the, the poor are getting less treatment, paying more for it, having higher premiums, having lower services, having being harder to get, whereas if you're wealthy and can afford these tax shelter kind of things that, that they set up, then you can do really well by the, by the yeah, healthcare bill. Yeah, well, it's tricky to be wealthy. <laughs> there we go. Why, right. why didn't we figure this out before? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, for example, Medicaid, is, you know, he's trying to cut Medicaid. I mean, he's, it's just gross. Although, although note that he I mean, promised repeatedly as a candidate he would not touch Medicaid, he would not hurt Medicaid in the least. And we have to explore at least what we think about the reasoning behind all of this. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about science for, for a moment. You're, you're a scientist, mm -hmm. and I think um, science has, in our lifetime, is that expanded sure. uh, in, in not only in its uh, theoretical, uh, you know, development uh, and, the, and the progress, enormous progress in so many areas, but also in the fact of affecting our lives. Can you talk about that? Right. It's, it's, it's pervasive now. I mean, every day we're using science and technology more and more. We've all got our cell phones. We've got computers. I mean, this, this studio here that we're in is filled with a gazillion dollars worth of, of high-tech fancy equipment. You know, 30 years ago, virtually none of this would have been available in any, except in the crudest possible way. Uh, the cars we drive now have very fancy electronics, right? No, you can't. Nobody can go and fix their own cars anymore, right? You can't get out your little circuit uh, board. Yeah, you can't get out your little 
gapper and, and do your spark plugs <laughs> and, and that kind of stuff. You know, it's light years from what it was, right, uh, right. you know, even 50 years ago. And with science and technology being that ever more deeply and pervasively intertwined in our daily lives, it's it's very important that we teach our kids and we all gain some basic understanding of what science is really all about. And, and to see this again, this this sort of wholesale dismantling of, of uh, the scientific infrastructure of this country, the, the, the departments and groups that support science is, yeah. is very, a very troubling trend. So, well, science has, you know, since uh, World War II, science has done remarkable things and mm -hmm. it has become, uh, you know, a central culture point for the United States anyway. Right. It has made us, among other things, it has made us a world leader. It has. And there was a huge, actually speaking of cultural wars, there was a huge cultural war right after World War II with Vannevar Bush being sort of leading one troop one set of troops and I forget who it was, the senator from West Virginia leading the other, Bush insisting that scientists should basically be in charge of science, that they should determine how science goes, and the West Virginia senator basically saying, no, the government should determine what science will or will not investigate. Scary. And we went one way and, and we've, yes, we've thrived immensely, although obviously, as was pointed out, some people have been left behind by, by the, the advances that science made, and those, those are the people largely who voted for Trump, interestingly. So, you know, we have uh, communication has right. been tremendously affected. Sure. I mean, we could go on. Um, transportation has been Medicine. tremendously affected. Right. Um, everything we eat has been tremendously right. affected. Right. Uh, our society has been transformed, not once, but, you know, continually right. since World War II. Right. Uh, we have come into a kind of space age by virtue of the science that we've done, mostly here in this country. Right, right. Although, you know, there's science elsewhere. But over time, it seems to me that our progress in this country has been a beacon for the rest of the world. Absolutely. And they have followed it, they have run right. parallel to it, uh, and they've emulated it. Look at right. China, you know, emulating sure. our science for so many years, right. and now e effectively abreast with it, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe surpassing it. Right. And so it defines our society. You can't go back to Walden Pond and live the simple life anymore. Right. You can't. And, and, and there is a very funny sort of tension that is science calls for certain kinds of behaviors that are sort of contrary to maybe the, the, the human instinct, if I can use that term. Uh, Steve Pinker, uh, I want to read a brief quote from Steve Pinker who put it rather well. He said, the success of science depends on, a, on an apparatus of demo, democratic education. Anonymous peer review, open debate, the fact that a graduate student can criticize a tenured professor. These mechanisms are more or less explicitly designated to counter human self-deception. People always think they're right, and powerful people will tend to use their authority to bolster their prestige and suppress inconvenient opposition. You try to set up the game of science so that the truth will out despite this ugly side of human nature. You know, I, I think he captures it rather well there. There's a lot well of points know. in there. One is that the, there is an ugly side to human nature. Right. Remember, we have had to survive for the last sure. 120,000 years. And survival, you know, of the fittest means, um, you know, that you have mechanisms that, that make you survive. Sometimes they're not pretty. Sure. No, so, I mean, fundamentally, we're all sort of greedy, self-centered, uh, yeah. grasping beings, right? That, that's yeah. sort of what your genes are telling you to do to, to get by for the next day, you know? The other thing is that science is, and this is really important to take away for this show, for me anyway, um, the science is a search for truth, mm -hmm. for truth, for the real truth. Right. Um, and of course, um, you know, we theoretically, morally, we like truth, but pr truth is always under attack right. somehow because there's a lot of untruth out there and right. sometimes it works, you know, there's a tipping point goes the wrong way. But the other thing, and the last thing I'll take out of that quote in this discussion so far, um, is that it's not easy to find truth. Right. Truth, truth is, is problematic. Truth is elusive. And science, is, as a search for truth, is elusive. You have to work really hard. I exactly, exactly. I, I'll read just another brief quote, if I may, uh, from uh, uh, Sheila Jasanoff, who, who wrote this in Science and Technology. She said, truth in the public domain is not simply out there, ready to be pulled into service neatly like the magician's rabbit from a... Uh, from a hat. On the contrary, in democratic societies, public truths are precious collective achievements, arrived at just as good laws are, through the slow sifting of alternate interpretations based on careful observation and argument and painstaking deliberation 
among trustworthy experts. And that's what Trump and his colleagues are doing, is taking away the trustworthy experts. They're getting rid of them. They're getting them out of government. So we can't have that. So we can't ever arrive at a public truth anymore that everyone sort of agrees, like, yeah, we'll all say, like, this is okay. This is how the world's working. They want to undermine all that. Yeah. yeah. And when we come back from this break, we should talk about why. Yeah. How. Right. And why. Right. Ooh, Ethan, this is getting really <laughs> interesting. That's Ethan Allen. He's co-host here on Likeable Science Today. He's usually the regular host, <laughs> but today we co-host. Once in a while we co-host. We have great fun. We'll be right back after this break for more. Aloha. I'm Tim Apichaw, host for Moving Hawaii Forward, a show dedicated to transportation issues and traffic. We identify those areas where we do have problems in the state, but also the show is dedicated to trying to find solutions, not just detail our problems. So join me every other Tuesday on Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apicella. Thank you. You can be the greatest. You can be the best. You can be the king come banging on your chest. You can beat the world. You can beat the war. You can talk to God go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up. You can beat the clock. You can move a mountain. You can break rocks. You can be a master. Don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Okay, we're back. We're live. Ethan Allen and me um, talking about truth, <laughs> talking about science as a way to find truth, and talking about the government as a way sometimes that you under, undermine truth and science. And, uh, you know, what's very troubling now is that we, we have an apparent effort uh, by this administration, this government, to undermine science and truth. And on the point of truth, there was yet another article. I, I read the Leonhardt, uh, Leonhardt um, opinion piece out of the New York Times every day, and he was talking about an update on their, their truth matrix, uh -huh. or their lie ma matrix. They, they pick the things that are clearly lies, not just half-truths, but lies, not exaggerations, but lies that Donald Trump makes, and they keep a record, they keep a matrix of it, and, <laughs> and, and they update it every few days. And, it's been growing like topsy. It's really, <laughs> it's really big now, sure. and it keeps on going, and, and perhaps it's getting worse. Wow. And so, you know, uh, he's, he's not only in a war with the press, he's in a war with, with truth. And so we, we should be very concerned because truth and science are the same. I mean, there is the science of finding truth. Right. So <clears throat> what you have is this the whistleblower Clements mm -hmm. um, and many others. Uh, I noticed at the bottom of that article in the, when you sent it to me that there were a list of similar circumstances, right. similar whistleblowings at various other agencies. Yeah, exactly. This right. is happening across the board. It doesn't require congressional approval. Right. It's just him pulling the wings out right. of, uh, of what we have learned so far. And I'd like to make one other point before we go forward and try to figure out why. And that is that, well, <clears throat> back in the day of radio on HBR, we had Jack Balkin come around. Jack Balkin was, is still the dean of constitutional law at Yale Law School. And um, I was concerned about Bush, about W, uh, and how he had you know, rolled back a lot of the gains before him, sure. which he did. I mean, but his rollback is nothing like Trump. Trump is mm -hmm. way logarithmically more. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I said to uh, Balkan on the radio, he's a good guy, said to him, you know, can we reverse what Bush has done? You know, is this going to spring back like a rubber band as soon as he's out of office? And uh, I, I mean, in some ways, it's a naive question. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, no, no, Jay, it's not going to do that. It's history, and history moves on. It always moves forward, no matter mm -hmm. what. And when we, get, when we get to another president, when Bush is out of office, we're going to have to cope with what he did. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to work and, and fight just as we did in the first place right. to, to realize these, 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 these points of progress. Right. They don't come back automatically. You have to fight for them yet again. Right. And, and, and I think we have to recognize that what, what uh, Trump is doing is much worse. Is, um, he's pulling the wings out of the best you know, improvements, the best, the best progress we've made in, in our lifetimes. He's rolling us back to another time. Some people think it's the 12th century, but mm -hmm. it's another time, a long time ago, and it's a time that was not nearly as enlightened as we, we have had in more recent years. And, and so can the same question to Jack Balkan, 
can we reverse that when his term is up? And I hope it's up soon. Um, I mean, we all hope it's up soon. Even the people don't admit they hope it's up soon. Everyone hopes it's up soon. And the damage he's doing at every level. But can we reverse that like a rubber band when he's finished? The answer is no. If you pull out the wings on EPA regulations, you have to start again from scratch later. We are, we are actually being rolled back in every way right now. It's very hard to recapture what we've lost. He, he still has not filled a whole bunch of the government positions that he was entitled to and supposed to fill. He's basically going to let uh, large chunks of the government die from attrition and that will become the new normal, and, and we'll all decide, oh, it's okay, we, we can get by without this kind of oversight, without these kinds of regulations, without these kinds of watchdogs. You know, and, and I, don't, I don't think we can, uh, quite frankly. It's, it's, it's changing our country. I mean, we, you know, you, you, don't, you want to deny that. You right. want to ignore that. Oh, please don't. Right. I don't want to be, be right. close to this issue. I don't want yeah, to, you know, we all want to just cover our eyes and ears and bury our heads. Yeah, and, say, and that's, that's a tendency. Right. And like Leonhard said in one of his other columns, he says, if you find somebody who is was a Trumper, um, you know, who doesn't want to talk to you, who actually sort of gives you a kind of a moral imperative, don't talk to me about this because I'm not going to agree with you. you, know, you have a duty to talk to that person, right. to try to bring that person back to reality. Right. Uh, we live in a polarized community right. now. No, we, should, we should all be working on getting civil discourse as a, as a routine part of yeah. uh, things, even so that is not being modeled well by our president at all. Yeah. And now the big question. I mean, I've been waiting this whole show to <laughs> open this with you. And it goes to this article I found this morning. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is Trump and the people around him, Bannon, for mm -hmm. example, why are they doing these things? Why are they pulling the wings out of our progress over the past 50 years? Why are they doing that? Greed? Is it ideology? No, I mean, no, for example, no. he's he's knocking on um, you know uh, right to life and, and you know and abortion and all that issue. He's knocking on that every day, and there's things happening around this country where you know people are trying to diminish you know women's choice mm -hmm. uh, and, and undo uh, Roe v. Wade yeah. every day, yeah. and he's behind that. He's doing that. Yeah. Um, hard to reverse the, the the damage they are doing to our society. Right. Uh, and especially the disadvantaged people. They're right. the ones who suffer, you know. Oh, oh yeah. The, the, the people at sort of the bottom end of the socioeconomic spectrum are the people who are bearing the brunt of all this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So why? But, is, it because, is it ideological? Is it religious? Uh, is, it, is, is it political? I mean, have we come I, to... I think a lot of it's just due to simply the greed. Greed? Yeah. You that, keep that, coming back to that. Yeah, that, that he... I think Trump and his ilk basically believe that your value as a human being is largely reflected in your monetary value of your goods and possessions that you control. And, you know, those with the money count. And thus anything that brings more money into his pockets and the pockets of his family is basically almost by definition You mean he's good. president to make a buck? Oh, yeah. Oh, I think so. I think so. I mean, almost everybody, as I understand it, who goes through the presidency, comes out considerably richer than they walked into it, and uh, with a lot, a lot of nothing earning, else than writing books. A, a lot of, yeah, earning potential at the other end. Um, now some people... But it's different for him. Yeah, some people like Jimmy Carter do great. You know, Jimmy's still out there at 91, 92, hammering away on houses for ha Habitat for Humanity, and I think that's just wonderful. He yeah. was out there getting heat stroke the other week from that. <laughs> uh, and you can't, can't, can't imagine Trump doing that. You can't no. imagine Trump ever He's not that. an idealist at no, all. No, no. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I ask you provocatively, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you still, you still believe that? And the answer is I believe it too. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm coming to a kind of shattering real, realization here, just watching, being an observer on what's happening and seeing the literature and seeing the news stories that come out. Um, I think you have a, a major point there. He's doing it for greed. Mm -hmm. And the people around him are doing it for greed. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about little greed. No. We're talking about greed, a hundred stories high greed, that kind of Right, kind. and it's, it's utter sort of lack of a moral compass, right? I, I mean, Trump Jr., when he was presented with this, you know, the Russians approached him and said, we have this damaging information about Hillary. And you know, with, a, with an ounce of moral sense would have said, well, let me go to the FBI right away, and you know, because I'm being approached by a foreign power with this kind of, who's trying to interfere in our election. 
he said, oh, goody, you know, yes, I'll take the meeting. And, and to this day, he's never sort of apologized for it. He's never sort of said, well, that, that was a mistake, or gee, I didn't think it got through, or whatever. No. It's never. It, he doesn't apologize no, no, for anything. Not right. even right. indiscretions in the locker room. Right, yeah, right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, again, it's, it's, it's an appalling. But let's, let's, let's look at it in a slightly larger sense, because he's not alone on this. No. Now, there's, there's two kinds of followers, I think. One is the follower who has no clue uh, about, you know, why mm -hmm. he's doing this, who, who follows him blindly because he wants to see that kind of anti-establishment um, populist thing come up, you mm -hmm. know. He's, he's beating up the establishment, beating up the beltway. He mm -hmm. must be right. Uh, even if you know you have questions logically about why he lies and all the, right. does all these really stupid things, um, that's one kind. But the other kind is the kind that's closer in, like Bannon, who have philosophical motivations, who have mm -hmm. strategies and plans right. that are large, that are that hundred stories high, yep. and it's it's about greed. It's about their view of capitalism in this country. Right. And I I, I, I want to tell you about my article that mm -hmm. I found. It's right. called uh, wait. There it is. <laughs> in The Guardian. Right. It's a responsible news organization, mm -hmm. right? It's, uh, the title of the article is A Despot in Disguise, One Man's Mission to Rip Up Democracy. Right. And it's written by a fellow named George Monbio. And it, it, the, the guy they're talking about, it's a little ambiguous here, because mm -hmm. the guy they're talking about in the article is James McGill Buchanan, who's right. deceased. Uh -huh. Okay. But you get the distinct impression reading in this article. I urge everyone to read this article. You know, that is, we're not talking about James Buchanan. He died a long time ago. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. um, and and, it, and it's, it's tripped off this book. It's called uh, The Missing Chapter. Well, that's not the name of the book, but the article begins to describe it. It's The Missing Chapter, the key to understanding the politics of the past half century. You have to read Nancy McLean's new book, Quote, democracy in chains, colon, the deep history of the radical rights stealth plan for America. Mm -hmm. To see what was previously invisible that we didn't see before, before the Trump administration has yeah, revealed this. Right, by being just right out front with this, this is naked greed. Huh? Yeah. What, what, was the, what was the first thing when Trump met with the leaders of India that he talked about? Was it, you know, the growing population in India, the, the, the role, shifting role in the world, pollution issues? No, it was his hotels. And that was the, yeah. the, the subject of their first meeting. I'm not sure I fully understand the stealth plan, but I understand it in, in, in gross terms, and I understand it well enough i got to read this book. Yeah. Oh. But I think from the article, the one in The Guardian a couple of days mm -hmm. ago, um, it's something like, we want to use democracy as a way to express our greed. We want to use democracy to take as much money as we can possibly take. We want to be so rich, you know, it hurts. And we don't give a rip about anyone else. No. And we bring our buddies in, the ones who like us, we like them, we have a little club. Yep. And, and that club, you know, all works together to take the money from the poor and give the money to the rich. Yep. And if you start thinking about that as a larger plan, as a James Buchanan plan, mm -hmm. as a Trump plan, you know, you think, gee, well, maybe that's why we don't give any money to science, to right. research, to education. Right. We don't give it <coughs> any money to medicine. Right. We don't give any money to uh, <coughs> Medicaid. <coughs> we take it all away from the, the people who can least afford having money taken away. We, we make tax reform that, that gives breaks to the rich and, yeah. and uh, you know, right. does regressive things to the poor. All these things are consistent with moving the wealth yeah. more and more into the hands of the rich right. and away from the regular, ordinary people. Right. Um, and this is the scariest thing that has yet surfaced in evaluating what kind of administration we have here. Right, right. Yeah. So, what can the scientists do? Uh, like Joel uh, uh, Clement did, you speak out, you stand up and say, this is wrong. You know, this, he filed a complaint basically not only on sort of a whistleblower thing on him being fired or wrongly transferred basically, but basically that, that by leaving his position empty, uh, the interior is doing harm and not carrying out their mission they should be, they are obligated to do. Um, so, uh, you know, sort of fight with every tool at your disposal. Yeah. 
Well, it sounds like, you know, all little elements of a larger plan to sort of defrock the government, to change the government, change the way the government works, and to change the way the people support or don't support the government. And all in all, um, you know, this idea about mm, expanding capitalism or changing the notion of capitalism, I'll tell you more after I read the book, um, you know, it, 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 it sounds like a kind of new fascism. Yeah. It sounds like an industrial fascism and uh, as we saw in, in Germany back in the in right. 1930s. Yeah. So uh, all these are indicia, right, of, the, of maybe of that plan. And I mm -hmm. think we have to watch these indicia going forward to see whether it plays out consistent with that theory. Right. Can we, can we see the pattern emerging early enough to do something to stop that? I don't know. Yeah. I certainly hope so. Yeah. Don't think about it. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Jay. Great to talk to you. Pleasure, pleasure as always. Aloha. Indeed. <laughs>